Just like if we were at the theater, but we are not. We are in the house of God. So, anyway, good morning. We've got uh, an unusual morning this morning. We've got a lot of folks that usually are behind the scenes that um, have been asked to stay home this morning uh, because of their sickness. And so we said, stay home. We don't want you here this morning. Just watch on Facebook uh, because we don't want to catch whatever it is you've got. So we appreciate them doing that this morning. And uh, while they're out, I want to say it is great to see you here this morning. And we're looking forward to what God has this morning. We're excited. And uh, we've been here early, since early this morning, just praying and uh, sharing our hearts together this morning. And uh, having church before you guys got here. So you join in and we're going to have a good time this morning. Let's stand to our feet and uh, let's open in prayer. And then we're going to jump right into our first song. And uh, give God some glory and some praise. And uh, the name of this song is Waiting Here for You. And uh, so you listen to this, you sing along. But let's pray, let's ask the Lord to to, uh, be with us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness this morning. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for every single person that has joined us this morning, either in person or online. Lord, we just ask and pray that you would minister to hearts today. Now that's not something that we can manufacture. That's not something that we can drum up. Lord, we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to operate and to function through your word. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that you would help us as we uh, sing and preach and teach your word this morning. Lord, I pray you would help us, Lord, as we're here this morning to function in the body of Christ as we are directed to so by your word. Let us encourage one another. Let's lift each other up. Some of us have had a long, tough week this week. It's been hot. It's been humid. Many have been out in the conditions. Many are sick this week, watching from their bed. Lord, we just pray and ask this morning that you would bring strength, that you would bring comfort, and that it's through your name. We love you this morning. We lift your name up together. We praise you for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Let's worship together this morning.
again this morning. I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go ahead and jump into that next song. This next song is called Holy Spirit. And we believe here at New Covenant Church that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity of God. And we believe that He operates uh, through what we believe is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three in one. And that the Holy Spirit is our guide and our comforter. He is what was given to us when Jesus left to go be with the Father, to ever live, to intercede for us as we speak. But as we sing this song, there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. There's nothing to compare. You are living hope, your presence, Lord. To walk in the presence of the Spirit of God every moment of our life takes a sacrifice that we must be willing to pay. And that sacrifice is an obedience to our Heavenly Father. And so I want to encourage you this morning that we're not just singing songs because it's something that we, we, uh, we just threw up there. We, we came this morning together and we asked the Lord, Lord, we had a whole set planned and He said, you know what? I don't like that. We're going to do something different. So everything that's done this morning has been givenly directed by the Spirit of God. And we're just so thankful that He leads, guides, and directs in that way. Now just like He does that in a, in a worship team or at a body of Christ, at a church, He does that in your life individually. As a mom, raising children, as a husband, being uh, the, the caretaker and the lover of the home, as taking care of your wife and your wife being the help me to the home and the children as a child, as a single mom, as a single father, uh, as a teenager, as a grandparent, individually walking every step of the way, being obedient to the Lord as He gives you direction through His Word. So where are we this morning with that? He's like, well, I thought we were preaching after the fact. Well, we preaching now. Because this is what I need to hear this morning. Because you know what happens is we get so comfortable doing good things, things around the house of God, being right, living right, that we can sometimes be farther from the Lord because we are doing what's comfortable and not what's obedient. And the, the best place to fall into that trap is right here. Being surrounded. I come to church this week. I feel good. Everything's working out. And, and everything just seems like it's just, just falling into place. And then we decide to make that step towards Him in obedience. And then the pressure starts to fall on us. The pressure is... A, process that is an ingredient for a growth and a maturity in a walk with Christ that you cannot get any other way but through discomfort. But on the other side of that is that diamond. And if we're not willing to be refined in the fires, we're not fires. Sounds like an Alabama dude. In the fires... If we're not willing to be refined in the fires that God places in front of us sovereignly because He is ours and we are His, then we're just singing verses. But I want to challenge us this morning as we move forward in this service that we will listen to Him when He speaks to us. Amen? Let's sing. Let's worship this with this song this morning and give him some praise.
sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit you're here for the very first time thank you so much for joining us this morning and uh, if I could get you just to have a seat everybody and uh, if you are here for the first time just slip your hand up we've got a card we want you to uh, fill out thank y'all for being here from South Boston Virginia is that right and uh, from the Halifax area uh, Good Hope Church a dear friend of mine uh, and uh, 
Jesse and uh, their church there is a church plant from the Good Hope in, uh, um, what is it, Danville, Virginia, up there. So I always thought South Boston was like South Boston, um, but it's not actually South Boston. It's just called South Boston. I was confused for a little while because, uh, uh, you know, it's just different up there. The mountains and it's all flat here and just beautiful. Anybody ever been, I think, AL's from that area, uh, Ms. Linda? But anyway, thank y'all for being here. And everybody else, thank you for coming back. We didn't scare you off. And uh, we are starting a new series this week. And uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, in the Old Testament, we're going to be able to see some of all the things that we looked at in the uh, tabernacle and the high priest. And, and there's discipleship in the very first chapter. It's pretty cool. And so we're looking forward to that. So um, let's go ahead and run some uh, announcements Find out what's happening. we got a busy September coming up. A lot of things uh, starting up. Let's just see what the Lord has for us. We're so happy you're here with us today. If you're here for the first time, we'd love to tell you thank you. And we have a small gift for you at the end of the service. If you'll meet one of our pastors in the back corner over there, that we would love to give you. It either be Pastor Fred, myself, or Pastor Scott. So come join us afterwards so that we can give that to you and get a chance to talk with you a little bit more. Thank you. All right, if you're joining us online today, we want to tell you thank you. And if you will, in that bottom corner, hit like and subscribe so that we can know that you're on here with us. And also, there's a click down there for a connection card. If it's your first time on here, give us a chance to get to know a little bit about you and to be able to pray with you. And we would love, for, love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today online. Hey, if you're here today and you're praying about a way that you can get involved, there, are, there is a ministry that could use your help. And that would be our nursery workers. That is helping in there during the, during the service with the children. And that is a huge opportunity for you to be able to let moms and dads get a, get a chance to come in and get ministered to. So if you're interested in that, please see us after the service. We would love to have you get involved with that and talk with us about it. Thank you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. The Great Commission. Pastor Scott will be teaching a 10-week course through the Timothy Initiative, Making Disciples. That is our mission as Christ followers. I will. Will you? 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 I will. And how about you? Will you join us? All right, here at New Covenant Church, we believe that giving is an act of worship. And there are several ways that you can give. You can give in the offering baskets as we pass them out in a minute. Or you can give online. Or you can go through the Tidely app. Or you can drop it in the mail. Whichever you want to do. Giving is a chance for us to give back some of what God's given us to be able to further His kingdom and His glory. Uh, my verse for today is Psalms 121 verse 1. I will lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, I know that's different English than what we use today, so let's put it back in that uh, Alabama redneck that I like to work with. He says, I'll lift my eyes up to the hills because I know that's where my help comes from. And he goes on, he says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, my help comes from somebody that's stronger, that's greater, that is more powerful than anything this world has to offer. He's actually the one who made the earth and who made you and me. So when next time you need help, which obviously for you and me is every moment of every day, if we'll look up and just draw strength from the fact that He is the one who can and who will. God bless you today. So we have lots of things that are happening, um, and we'll get to more in depth to that as far as what, what uh, we've got several uh, ministries starting up, um, our Fostering Joy uh, we'll be meeting the third Monday of August um, this next month coming up. And then it'll probably change. We don't know yet as far as the day or the night. 
uh, for September because grief share will also be starting back. Um, and that's going to be for our community and anybody that wants to be a part of that. Um, if you've lost a loved one or a spouse or anything like that, um, and you would like to know how to um, handle that grief um, in a healthy way, um, that would be a great thing to do. Um, my wife and I uh, have been a part of it. We've done it. And uh, it's made a huge difference in our life. Uh, and so we're thankful for that. And uh, Miss Janet Hutchinson uh, is going to be leading that and helping out with that in the near future as we move forward. Um, so I got to say this, and I'll say this every Sunday, our discipleship program that's starting up in September um, it's actually going to be taught by Pastor Justin, uh, and then I'll be filling in here and there um, to help out with that. But that's going to be our, our, our big push, and we're excited about that, and, uh, and our step of faith also, and, and the opportunity to uh, give uh, to help plant churches globally. We'll talk about that more uh, as we step out in faith together as a church and uh, watch God do some amazing things through a small uh, unity of believers. Amen? Looking forward to that. Let's stand and let's do this. We hadn't done this. Um, well, we just started this back, but let's, let's uh, on your row, somewhere around there, there's going to be some music playing. And uh, just greet somebody, stand to your feet, and let's greet somebody in the Lord and just say thank you for being here. If I could have my ushers, if they will come, and let's get ready to give. All right. Probably should have you standing so you can get better access to your giving pockets. That's a Baptist joke. Benita's back there just shaking her head. Well, boy, don't ever stop talking. <laughs> Anyway, let's pray. Let's thank the Lord for what he's done for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, what we're about to do to be able to give back to you what already belongs to you. We just ask and pray that you would bless it. Use it, Lord, as we move forward by faith uh, in, in stretching our, our faith in our giving as a church. I pray you would help us as we uh, look to that and are excited about what you're going to do. Just pray and ask that you would help us, Lord, individually. Or one of the hardest things to, to let go of is, is the things that, that we uh, work hard for. And we just pray and ask that you would help us to realize, uh, Lord, it all belongs to you. And we just honor you by giving you back a small portion of that, uh, Lord, as an accountability to, to you to know that you give it to us as, as a, 
um, a blessing. And we just pray and ask that you would uh, use this, this little bit of money for your glory and for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. stand to sing this last song before we preach give God some praise and glory through that we'll dismiss the kids in the chorus
last chorus one more time. Let's say it. Invite all the young people that they will go out to the C4 class. Your teachers are waiting and they are looking forward to it. See ya. Bye. Enjoy it. Make lots of noise. <laughs> Read some books. All right, let's sing this last chorus one more time. He loves us. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, for your goodness this morning. Thank you for your word. As we open it up, I pray that you would bless, encourage, strengthen our hearts this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's have a seat and let's dig. Morning, everybody. Morning. You know, I, I start <clears throat> preaching every time I get to preach now knowing that I'm disappointing somebody in Ohio. and That's a weird thing to say, but a, a few times ago, during the pandemic, a lot of my family in Ohio would, their churches came back a lot later than we did, and they would watch our church services. And after I preached one Sunday, I was out there, and one of my nieces texted me, and she said, hey, I just saw you preach. I said, I said you know, cool. She goes, yeah, she said, I, was, uh, I tuned in hoping to see Justin, but there you were. <laughs> so here I am, um, Kristen. Uh, so I don't know <laughs> what's wrong with my family. They ain't right. Um, so... Uh, yes, uh, so Justin will watch this and learn that he has fans in Ohio <laughs> way more than his Alabama football team does, I guarantee you. Uh, <laughs> that is exactly right. There's nobody in Ohio <laughs> like in Alabama. As Scott said, we're going to start uh, this week with uh, 1 Samuel, and uh, I get uh, the honor of, of starting it off. 1 Samuel is an introduction. It was written about 3,000 years ago, around 1100 uh, B.C., um, and uh, most of it was written by Samuel. A couple of prophets finished it uh, for reasons that will become obvious as we go along. Uh, but uh, First Samuel is a great book. It's a good book. Uh, parts of it are good to, to, to read to your kids. This is David and Goliath. Uh, those kind of action stories. There's love stories. There's downright soap opera stories. It, it's really got a lot uh, going for it uh, for everybody. But like I said, it's written. Uh, it, it's a transitional book. Um, before this, uh, it was a, the government was a theocracy, basically. Got, why, what is making this clicking? I got, yeah, ain't my beard hitting this thing now. I'm, anyway, the, um, it was a theocracy. Basically, God told them what to do, uh, and whenever they didn't do it and worked their way into trouble, he raised up a judge, and uh, a judge from the book of Judges, if you read that, that he worked them out of it. He, God used the judges to, to solve problems. But Samuel here is the last judge. Uh, the people start crying out for a king. They want a king like other places have. And uh, th this book, uh, this, one of the themes of this book could easily be, be careful what you ask for. But they want kings. And uh, so that's how, we, how Samuel happens. Uh, we start off here at 1 Samuel uh, one two, or one one. I'm sorry. And verse one and two. Let me get us there. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jero Jero Jerohim. I'm terrible at the name, so y'all don't laugh at me too hard. Son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, 
and the, the other the name of the other was Panina and Panina had children but Hannah had no children uh, we can't hide the fact right off the bat here is that at times in the Bible there is polygamy bigamy times now it, it's not God's plan God didn't start the world with pig, with polygamy is actually uh, one of uh, one of the descendants of uh, Cain was the first polygamist in the Bible. Uh, so that's not exactly a happy family tree to start with, but we can't hide from the fact that David had seven wives, and David was a man after God's own heart. But the thing is, is that God made Adam and Eve a couple, not a thruple, and then. <laughs> Later on, God made, or then at, when Noah got on the ark, who did God say he could take with him? His wife, his sons, and they got one wife each. No carry-ons. That's it. So this has been God's plan. God's plan is always one, uh, one man and one woman. Uh, Paul, if anybody had any doubts, Paul said in... Um, in 1 Corinthians, he said, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So if a man has two wives, those wives do not have their own husband. They're sharing one. So that ain't biblical. And so God, it basically the Bible reports that these things happen, but it really doesn't condone them. Uh, we just know it happened. And uh, honestly, when I read this story from the beginning, I've read it a hundred times, the... Uh, the, the, it starts off like a beautiful, you just read it and it's written so beautifully that you read, it's, it's a lovely, beautiful love story. And it's a mess. The whole story that we're going to go through today is just, it, it's, it's a mess. And we start off with a guy who's got, he's got two wives. Um, that's a problem. Uh, Matthew 19, here's what Jesus said about it. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast his wife. Wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Not the twain or the thruple or any of those weird things. That's God's plan. That's Jesus reiterating God's plan. A plan is a man and a woman, one each. So... We can't hide the fact that it's here. Now, then we read on and, and we saw that there's a problem. We, we got the problem introduced. Hannah doesn't have any babies. Uh, Panaya does. Uh, Panina ha has, has kids. Um, this has happened, uh, this happens several times in the Bible. And every time it happens, every time we read about it, God does something amazing. God raises up somebody out of these, these, these women uh, these prayerful begging women. Well, okay, we start with Sarah. She was not praying for a baby. She was 100 years old. And she laughed dead in the face of the angel who came and told her, you're going to have babies. Jesus laughed. And, and some believe that was actually Jesus uh, in, in what's called a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. But the Bible says it's an angel. She laughed right in his face when he told her she was going to have babies. But Sarah became, becomes the, the mother, basically, of the entire Jewish nation. Um, then there's, uh, who is called Manoah's wife, is the unnamed mother of Samson. She was barren. And then God gave her Samson after she, she asked him. She begged him, and she gave him back. And then there's Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who was also old. Uh, and then she had... John the Baptist, who was, uh, was the voice crying in the wilderness, make way, make straight the way of the Lord. So he introduced her. He went, came ahead of Jesus. And uh, so God has always done something amazing through these situations. Um, I started off with the polygamy thing. There were, good, there were reasons in those days for polygamy uh, that were, and of why I think God overlooked it. The, there was a lot of war in those days, so you had at times a lot more women than you did men. A lot of the men had died off in wars. And so that, that was one way. Uh, the Bible does allow for it when, um, when, when one brother dies, his brother uh, can take his wife. And this was a way of looking out for widows. They didn't have uh, 
Social Security uh, or anything, and they had to look out for their own widows. And if you read through the New Testament, you'll see that as the rules changed and as what was acceptable changed, there's a lot more focus on taking care of widows in the book of Acts. And the reason for that is that the rules had changed, and now these widows weren't able to be picked up and married by uh, and join another marriage, and, and so they had to be taken care of. And the church had to be uh, mindful of that, and they did. So these are the, some of the reasons for that, but uh, you know, I'm not saying that makes it good. Um, so let's move on. First Samuel 1 Samuel 1.3. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. Now I want you to picture this for a second. Listen, you think you've had fights on the way to church. You think you've had arguments. This man, this glutton for punishment, he has got to travel 15 miles to Shiloh with two fighting women. They don't like each other. They don't get along. He got a tassel of kids, two fighting women, to go on what's about a, a day and a half trip unless you've got two fighting wives and that, then it's an eternity. But they, he had to go there. But he's going up to worship. He's on his way to church. He's going up to sacrifice. Because um, that was, that was uh, their covenant with God. They would go and sacrifice. What does that mean? Why are they sacrificing? They're sacrificing because that's how God told them to handle sin. We're all born in sin. We all continue to sin. Why does this thing make this noise? Do you hear it, Scott? Because not, I'm not scraping. Oh, boy. I got raggedy hands. That's not going to be good. Sorry about that, y'all. Yep. All right. Woo. Now you hear me. Okay. Um, so anyway, this, he's, the reason for these sacrifices, like I said, that was their covenant. If you don't understand that, they understood and they were, they were taught by God and by their prophets that we all are born in sin. We all continue to sin. You can't be good enough. They couldn't be good enough. And they were taught to go. And God, God, God expected a blood sacrifice. He expected... For the wages of sin is death. He expected something to die. And he was going up to sacrifice because he believed. He had faith. And his faith was that he would go and sacrifice once a year. And that that, that death, God would apply to his account. And for one year, his sins would be covered. It's important to know that. It's important to know why they sacrificed in the Old Testament. Because it has a lot to do with what we do today. But... That's where he's going. He's going to worship. He's going to sacrifice. He's traveling uh, 15 miles uh, with the bickering, angry women. And uh, so on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peniah, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. See, this is the bickering part. The, um, we don't nowadays really jump to this, but you notice it mentions twice that the Lord had closed her womb. They believed that sin was what was closed in her womb. In those days, that's what they would believe. This is probably, by the way, why he has, it says he loved her. But it says he had babies with the other one, and this is probably why he had two wives. He probably, Hannah was probably his first wife. He probably married Hannah out of love, but then when he found out she couldn't have babies, he married the second one because it was very important to them to have an heir in those days, uh, way more important than it is to us now. And so they, this is why he had two wives more than likely, 
and he showed more love to one, he showed favoritism to one. Again, a mess. He shouldn't have two wives, but if you're going to have two wives, you've got to probably treat them equally. And uh, he, gives, he gives the one a double portion, and we'll find out here in a minute, she ain't eating anyway. She, she's not eating, but she's got double the food, and I don't know how he worked this out in his head. Did he make his kids go hungry? I don't know what he was really up to, but um, the reason they believe that you, uh, here's Deuteronomy 7. This is, this is where they got the idea that the Lord had closed her womb. And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. Okay, see, because you listen and keep these rules. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your hearts, and the young of your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your livestock. So there's Deuteronomy promising the Jewish people they wouldn't be barren. So if you had a barren woman, it obviously was because of the top part, uh, verse 12, because she wasn't listening to the rules or keeping them. That's how they applied it. That's how they believed it. And that's how we get to this uh, twice mentioning that uh, the Lord had shut up her womb. Uh, it seems harsh. And now she's got to travel 15 miles for a day and a half. And, 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 and probably the, the, the kids and they're like, hey, why don't Hannah have babies? Oh, Hannah, just making fun of her for not having babies. Uh, no doubt Paniah is bitter because he married her basically to use her to have babies and she sees that he loves Hannah. So there's a bitterness and, and she pours it out on her. Uh, so it went on year by year as often as she went up to the house of the Lord she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Um, it's interesting here. She, we, we don't ever read anything about her retaliating. She's not fighting back. She's just weeping and, and begging God. Uh, for a child is what we see. But this goes on year after year. Now why does God let this go on year after year? Why does she have to beg year after year? Well, well maybe, I, I don't know why, but maybe her heart wasn't right. Maybe up to this point she was asking God, give me babies to shut this woman up. Maybe she didn't have the, exactly the right reasoning for it. Maybe she thought, well, I don't want everything to go to her kids, so give me some kids so... My kids get something. And it, 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 we don't know what her heart was, but we know that here in a minute we're going to read how she gets her heart right and how she gives God the right reasons. I, I don't know how she prayed. Maybe she reminded God of his promises. Maybe he, she said, you promised there'd be no barren. And maybe she begged him that way. But we know she's begging God, and we know she's weeping, and she's, she's fasting, and it's that kind of deep... Uh, unintentional fast that comes on you when you're so burdened you can't eat. This is not the, the planned fast where you plan to fast a day a week, uh, which is nothing wrong with that, but this is the kind that just comes upon you. And she's so burdened she can't eat and she can't uh, stop crying and she can't stop praying. And uh, this is the situation she finds herself in. And now Elkanah comes along with great wisdom. I... Uh, I don't pretend to be the greatest husband in the world. I, I don't give people marital advice. Now, we've been married 38 years, so, but I completely and totally credit that to her long-suffering patience and a little bit of pity. Um, she's hung with me. I don't know why. I'm not the guy to give advice. I'm the guy who, in the first year of our marriage, she tried to make me biscuits and gravy because she knew I liked them. We were in Germany. She couldn't get help from my mom or anybody. She did the best she could. And I'm the guy who asked her to slice him off another piece of that gravy because it was too thick. It was, and uh, made her cry. So that's me. I don't need to. But here, even I can look at this situation and I know Elkanah, dude, this is not what you say to a crying, weeping, fasting woman who's be begging God for a kid. Ain't I enough? Look at me. You got me. You're good. It's going to be good. You got me. That ain't the answer. And she don't even respond to him that we see. She just want just, I'm sure she just shook her head and walked away from the, because I've seen that head shake and I've seen that walk away. 
I know how it works. Um, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall uh, touch his head. And she continued praying uh, before the Lord. Hannah was speaking in her heart only. Her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah said, No, my Lord. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your woman, your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, uh, you know, yeah, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have made of him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so she comes into the, the, the area. They, they've showed up at, uh, at their, the, the place where the uh, Shiloh, where the uh, Ark of the Covenant would be at. And they've come there to make sacrifice. And now she's just walking around um, crying and carrying on and her lips are moving and she's just tore up. And Eli is doing something I would uh, like to do. Uh, I would... Uh, the, Doorpost, also in Old uh, King James says post. What, another word for that, by the way, the way it's translated is porch. So he's basically sitting on the porch, people watching. That's fun. We've all done that. And now here comes this woman mumbling and just walking around, and she's just all kind of distressed, disheveled. It, this is not, but still, Eli's got a lot of problems, as we'll find out going on. I won't give you any spoilers. But as we go on in this book, you'll find out Eli's a mess. And one of his first problems we see here is that Eli is not a terribly discerning man of God. He does not understand what he sees. He immediately, he sees a praying woman and his first thought is she's drunk. That should not be the way the priest thinks. But she's praying and she's praying like a lot of us have. She's praying deep from her heart. It's not a planned prayer. It's not a... Uh, a heavily wordy prayer it's probably just repeating to God give me a baby God give me a son and she's crying from her heart to God from her heart he sees her lips moving and uh, so she vows a vow now biblically speaking it, that making a vow is a voluntary thing but once you've made a vow it's compulsory you promise God you're going to do something guess what you're supposed to do it you're the one who did it. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to vow a vow. As a matter of fact, it says to swear on nothing. But once you've done it, you've got to do it. You've got to do what you promised. And she vows a vow that I will give him uh, to the Lord. I, she don't have any kids, but she's bound to have seen what goes on with the other ones. And listen, I'm sure this doesn't apply to any of your kids. It doesn't apply to my grandkids either. Kids are monsters. <laughs> The, the notion that you can promise that you're going to make one so good that you, that they, you can de call them given to God, that's a tall order. We all set out to do it. It's our goal. It's all our goal. We all try to raise our children for the Lord, but it ain't easy. It's not an easy uh, task. They go how they go. But she's making a promise, a vow to God that I will give him to you all the days of his life. And then she says, I won't even, there won't be a razor to touch his head. That's a, a, a Nazarite vow, the same as what Samson had uh, his mother made. Uh, so she won't cut his hair and she's going to raise him uh, for the Lord. For the time she has him, she will dedicate him to God. Now, this is oftentimes used as a baby dedication uh, scripture. And, and it's good for that. But I want you to think just how hard this is. Um, 
In this day and age, people will, will accuse you of uh, indoctrinating. Your, that's indoctrination. Okay, it is. Don't get nervous about that word. That's just a word people have made sound mean, but we, that, that's what parenting is. You've got a doctrine of what time bedtime is, and you, you indoctrinate. You, in, you insist that they go to bed when, when you decide it's bedtime, right? You don't let them decide for themselves. You indoctrinate them to brush their teeth because you don't want to smell their skanky breath. So you just do it. That's your doctrine. I don't like bad breath. So we, that, that's what parenting is. It's been, that, that word has been twisted to mean something else. But listen, Muslim children come from Muslim homes. Uh, it, the Baptist children generally come from Baptist homes. Uh, Harry Krishnas come from airports, as far as I know. I've never, if, if, do they even have those anymore? Do you all even know what a Harry Krishna is? But anyway, that's the only place I ever saw one. Um, the, but anyway, we do indoctrinate. That's, that's kind of what we do. Don't let that word scare you off. Um, but we have to. Let me read this to you. This was written and published in 1926 uh, from the Minnesota Crime Commission. So they were, you, trust me, when I read this, you'll know you can't get away with writing this now. Um, every baby starts life as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch, or whatever. Deny him these things, and he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous if he were not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children, are born delinquent. And if you allow them to go their own way, they grow up to become criminals, what it says. Now, that's what we indoctrinate for is to make that not happen. But the truth is, that's what she's starting. She doesn't understand. God, give me a baby. I'm going to make him yours. And that's a wonderful goal. And it's a goal we should all have. But it's going to take some work because that's what you're starting with. You're starting with a thing with no doctrine whatsoever and no morals. The, the Bible says that I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother uh, conceive me. We are born with that sin nature. And I love little babies. I love them all. But... Any of you probably who's raised kids, you've been through that period of time where you realize that everything's fine and that baby's just lying and you've got to ignore its cries, right? It ain't hungry, it ain't wet or messy, and it's bedtime, and at some point in time you've got to get them to stay in bed, so you just do that thing where you sit in the living room and turn the TV up loud and hope that they eventually fall asleep because you know that they're telling you a little fib to get your attention. Screaming that same scream they scream when they're hungry, but you know they ain't hungry. They're born that way. I love them all, and I know you do too. And this is not meant to be bad about kids. This is meant to be, this is a, a tall order, what she has promised God. You're starting with a mess, and you've got to raise it for God. But that's what mothers do. That's what parents do. It's all we hope for. It's all we pray for. Our prayer is that when it's all said and done, we know she's going to take this baby to the Lord. And we pray that when it's all said and done, our kids say, they brought me to Jesus. That's what we're trying to do. And that's your only hope, by the way, to raise anything decent, is to bring them to Jesus. Let the Lord do the work for you. Let him deal with them. And that's what we try to do, and that's what we set out to do, and that's what Hannah sets out to do. And that deep down, deep-hearted uh, praying um, and then what happens is she gets that peace that passes all understanding. God answers, or lets her know that her prayer will be answered. I don't think when we read that, and Eli said, you know, go, God grant your prayer. I don't think he's uh, prophesying that she's going to uh, have, have a baby. I think he's, it's basically a prayer. Go your way. God grant you your, your wish. He's, that's a prayer. Uh, and the Bible tells us that she goes on for a while. Uh, we don't know how long. But it says, uh, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkaniah knew his wife. And the Lord remembered her. 
And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So in due time, not because the, the, the priest of no discernment said it would happen, not because of anything else, but in God's time, she will have a son. Because God's got plans for this boy. God's got plans for her son. She's going to raise him for God, or she's going to give him to the Lord, and everything's going to go exactly the way, the way God plans it. But it has to be done in due time. It has to be done in his time. Now, um, now we know what happens. Why, if you wonder why are we going into the Old Testament? Why, why does what happened 3,000 years ago matter to me? Why is this story going to matter? Why is the, the next part and the next part and the next part that we go through this? Why do we need to know this stuff? Well, the, the Bible is a long, long story that is so, has so much continuity from beginning to end. It has so many different authors. There are so many different books. Yet if you read it from beginning to end, it feels like the same person wrote it because the same person did write it. And in the beginning, in Genesis, God promises that he's going to send a redeemer right off the bat. He promises uh, Eve that he would send somebody uh, to bruise the serpent's heel. And as we go through the rest of the Bible from there, we're following those people. We're following the generations that come after Adam and Eve. And we're following them to its ultimate conclusion where God will promise, do as he promised and send someone to bruise the serpent's head. As, he go, as we go along through that, we can learn a lot. But what we'll find out, the, the ultimate part of this story is this same God that sees this lady's lips moving, this same God that hears her heart crying out for a son, this exact same God, after dealing with these stubborn people in one way after another, after making covenant after covenant that they could never keep, and watching them fail, after he, after he marched them out of Egypt where they were in slavery, he marched them out of there, he, he killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians, and he marched them out of there, and they started crying, well, you've brought us out here to die, Moses. And God, instead of giving up on them, God moved the ocean out of their way. And they crossed, and he dropped the ocean on their enemies. And they went, why'd you bring us out here to starve to death? And God said, I'll give them food. And then they went around and they said, oh, we're going to die of thirst. Weren't there graves back in Egypt, Moses? Why'd you bring us out here to die? No matter what these people did, God loved them and kept making a new way for them to have a relationship with him until ultimately this same God, that same God, put on flesh, put on a body because he loved his people so much that no matter how many times they faded away and proved that they didn't love him, he loved them and he put on flesh and he came down and he lived among them. And he lived by every rule that he had given them. He obeyed every command he gave them. He never sinned. He never got, uh, he never hated. He never coveted. That's a hard one. He never lusted. He went about his life and he completely lived up to what the standards he had set for these people that kept failing. And after all that, he became that sacrifice we talked about earlier. And he went to the cross and he, that, that's what we mean when we say Jesus died for our sins. He had no sins and he hung on a cross and he paid the price for yours. You owe God a sin debt right now if you've never accepted Christ. You owe him a sin debt. That sin debt will be paid. It's death. And that death means being separated from God forever. You owe that if you've never accepted Christ. But just like Elkanah and his family would go and they would sacrifice and they would walk away truly and totally trusting in God that their sins were forgiven for one more year. Now, once and for all, Jesus was the sacrifice. He was as sinless as those little lambs they sacrificed. He was blameless for the sins of others as those little lambs. And yet, he died to pay the price for your sin. And you put your trust in him the exact same way Elkanah and his family put their trust 
in that sacrificed lamb or goat or whatever they brought to sacrifice. That's what salvation is. That's what it means to be saved. But you can't do it yourself. It's completely by faith in Him through the drawing of the Holy Spirit. If you feel that calling, if you feel that urge in your heart, if you've been fighting that feeling that it, to, to accept Christ, to do, that's the Holy Spirit pulling on you, tugging at your heart, saying it's time. Don't put Him off for too long because only God can save you. Uh, let's all stand. I went way quicker than I thought I would, but that's okay. Um, I, it, there's a story that uh, gets told from time to time. I've, I'd heard it before, but I'll tell you guys. You may have heard it. But the, um, the, there's a man drowning. He's out in the middle of a lake, and he's just drowning. And there's nobody helping him. People are around the lake, surrounding the lake. They all see him drowning, but none of them are strong enough swimmers to go out and save him. And there's nobody there that thinks that they could save this man and they're watching him drown. But there is one guy, the best swimmer among them, and they know he could do it. And they just keep looking over to him and he just stands there. And he's watching the man drown. And they look over and he's watching the man drown. And finally, at the last second, right before the man goes under for the last time, right before he dies, the swimmer jumps in, goes, and rescues him and pulls him back. He saves him. And the people said, why did you wait so long? Why would you wait till the last minute like that? And he said, because I couldn't save him till he stopped trying to save himself. He would have drowned me. So I couldn't do anything for him till he stopped trying to do for himself. Listen to me. God can save you. God can rescue you from your sin. But he can't do it until you stop trying to do it yourself. Until you realize you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to do enough good works. Salvation is trusting in Jesus and what he did.
that if you're uh, if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, if you're not saved, that you'll find myself, Pastor Scott, Miss April. Some of the ladies here can show you. Or some of the other men can. Let us take a Bible and show you. Let us take you to Jesus. It'd be the best thing you ever did. If you're here and you're a first-time visitor, you're all over here. Uh, go back in the corner over here after church and see Pastor Scott. We have a gift to show you our appreciation for coming today. And we really do appreciate y'all being here. Um, and let's, uh, let's close the prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for, for your time, for this time. Uh, Lord, for, for, for the Word of God, for your Word. And these stories, Lord, how they, how they grow on us, how they become part of us, and how they change us. And Lord, uh, go with us for the next week. Watch over your people. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, just miss. Thank you.